uh, welcome to the Valencia College uh, Financial Symposium. Uh, as you heard earlier, or I don't know if you repeated that, you guys have been part of a study that it, it's going to change a lot of lives, a lot of students. Uh, I was one of the students, and I'm going to get to share that with you guys. Uh, today, quick, quick admin note. Whenever you see that picture again of that guy right here, be happy. The presentation is almost over, right? So you 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 got to keep your eye out for it. Um, in a presentation, we're gonna take the journey, and we're gonna I'm gonna explain what decisions a college student have to make while going to school, especially if they're first generation. We're we're gonna explore economic identity, why people make the decisions that they do. Uh, we are going to talk about behavioral economics, uh, where it comes into, you know, culture, society, status, all of that comes into play. And that's how people make decisions, right? Based on heuristics, based on framing, based on many other items. But today we're going to concentrate in heuristics and framing, uh, particularly. Um, then we're going to go into the income and, and and wages inequality huge topic political topic but it fits right into the mix so after we go through those four five things we're going to get into the five pillars of emotional intelligence the five pillars of emotional intelligence is basically going to be a, a guide for you or for anybody staff or faculty to be able to communicate and understand the student better um at the end, uh, you will be able to, to take the framework with you to be able to analyze your feelings and the feelings of others, and together you're going to be able to uh, develop or create good relationships, right? Central Florida is experiencing a, a, uh, dra a dramatic affordable housing crisis that directly and indirectly it affects students. And that creates havoc in their life. And some of them can finish uh, a college because of that. Um, then we also need to talk about um, in a region, tri-county area, Seminole, Orange, and Osceola, um, we suffer of low wages. And it's because of the industries that predominantly um, rule the, uh, the workforce. So we're also going to analyze that. Why? Because if you understand what the student is going through, I believe you're going to be able to help them go through it, right, and overcome. Slide number two, I'm going to talk to you a little bit about me. Um, I was born in Queens, New York. I grew up in the South Bronx. You see, now I'm not hot. Now I'm kind of cold. So I'm going to turn this off. So I, I grew up, uh, I was born in Jamaica, Queens. I grew up in the South Bronx. I lived there. Till I was 13 years old. After that, my parents and I moved to Ecuador. In Ecuador, I, I experienced my first culture shock at the age of 13, going from the South Bronx, baggy jeans and hip hop to Catholic school with suits every day. I did that for five years. I acclimated. I started to not listen to hip hop so much, but um, rock, hard rock and metallic and all of that, Guns and Roses. Then at the age of 18, I decided to come back, but I decided to come back to Florida. And we moved to Apopka. Apopka 23 years ago was a little bit different than what it is today. That was another culture shock. So I, I got to experience both things and uh, about in one piece, I guess. It's good. Education. Education has always been key for me. I used to sit in the Bronx in the 10 by 10 room that was our house inside of an apartment. They had the bunk beds right here. I remember my dad and my mom slept in the bottom. So my brother, my sister, and myself on the top, we had the refrigerator right here, the TV on that corner, and here was a window, and we always looked that side. I always thought there was more than the street corner where they were dealing drugs, and I knew education was a way out. So after I got back here, I got my AA. Well, I first had to learn English for two years. Then I got an associate's degree at Seminole Community College. Then we went to UCF. You're going to hear about my journey as a first generation through UCF. Later on, I got my MBA. You're going to hear about that, too, because it's a whole spectacle with it. And now I'm here talking to you, right? My interests, my interests have always been education. Because like I said, education is equalizer. Education is the way out. 
So I've always focused on getting programs into schools, into economic uh, limited areas like the South Bronx to educate other individuals because I'm sure there are more kids that know and understand that there's more to that neighborhood in the world. They're just trying to find a way out. Then I also got involved um, at the national level, right? So got an MBA. I met some people. I'm focused about education. Um, I got involved with the National Society of Hispanic MBAs. The National Society of Hispanic MBAs is an organization that's been around for 32 years, 30,000 members in 46 different cities around the nation, and that's what we do. We push to get the Hispanic professional educated, get an MBA, get into Fortune 500s, or become entrepreneurs, move up the ladder in corporate America, and when they get a seat in the corporate board, they have to send the elevator down, not the row. We want the elevator so I can send all the young ones through the elevator and we can start changing companies from the top down. It's the only way to do it. If you don't take them from the top, you will not change it from the bottom. Then I was so involved in, in education, and I still believe, and I'm still involved, that I even ran for office in Orange County School Board. I ran for uh, Orange County School Board seat District 3. I was not successful in winning the seat. But I became the political advisor for Univision and Telemundo. After that, I became the advisor. Um, I was part of the Hispanic Advisory Board for Orange County School Boards. And I'm extremely involved when it comes to that. So, and, and I learned that the elected official actually it does not have a good spot because as soon as they win, they become part of the others. And they get, and they got to be nice to one another. Me being on the outside, I can still call them names, even though I don't. I can still get to do it. <laughs> All right. So, uh, I, oh, and, I, and I'm an entrepreneur, right? So I, I got to highlight it because it's all part of the presentation. It's, it, it's going to come into play later. So as an entrepreneur, I believe that entrepreneurship is the answer of everything. Everything. Across the board. From a health issue to a political issue. If the entrepreneurship is not involved, it's not going to get solved. That's my belief. That's my opinion. That's a little bit about me. Okay, so now we're going to talk about what we're going to do today, right? We have 90 minutes, and we're going to tackle a lot of material. I ran out of time last time. I'm going to promise you I will speed it up a little bit today. So I first talked to you a little bit about me, spoke to you a little bit about me, so I'm ahead of schedule. Identity, I'm going to talk to you about identity. I'm going to talk to you about why people decide to do what they do, um, why people behave with the way they think they are and the smart ones behave how they think they're going to be or who they're going to become. So we're, we're also going to talk about identity economics. There's a book in identity economics I'm going to mention. I'm going to share a little bit about the book. Um, then we're going to talk about behavioral economics. Behavioral economics is how people make decisions based social and culture, budget and all of that. Um, we're going to focus on heuristics and framing. After that, we will talk about economic inequality, um, wage and income, as I said to you guys earlier. And uh, right after that is when the fund's going to begin. So I'm, I'm going to go through these things right here. Identity, behavioral economics, economic inequality, to talk to you about your Valencia student financial identity. Well, what they live or most likely how their experiences in college, during college, uh, when it comes to finances. Then I'm going to talk to you about the five pillars of emotional intelligence with the goal of bridging how you can learn more about the student and help them cope with um, the, the many changes that he or she are going to endure while going to college. So let's go ahead and start it. I'm, for some reason, I'm three minutes too early this time. So, let's, I time everything. What can I say? Uh, it's psychology, right? So, I'm going to talk to you about identity. Identity, psychology says identity is qualities, beliefs, personality, looks, and expression that make a person who they are. I'm going to hide again. Can't, can't make up my mind. I'm sorry. I put it in low. So, identity, right? 
Identity is the fact of being who or what we are or what thing we are. The choice of identity that we decide to be, it's the most important decision a person can make. The choice of identity is the most important decision a person can make, who you're going to be. Uh, identity is what you think of yourself and the way the view sees you, the characteristics that define you. So a student sees himself from his home coming out here. He has an identity. I'm going to go over that in a minute. But their world is a school and how the school sees him or her, how the school treats him or her is what solidifies his identity. We need to make sure that we know who they want to be or who they think they are because we got to treat them the same way. If not, there's going to be a disconnect. We, we are here to understand the college student, right? And uh, during the work that I have done, like I shared with you guys earlier, I'm an entrepreneur. So when you own a business, you start a business because you find a need, you create the solution, that's your solution, then you find the market, you define who you want to work with. At some point in the businesses that I've had or have, I focus on the Hispanic community. But I went a little bit of different about it. I wasn't going to assume that because I'm Hispanic, I'm going to understand what they do. Oh, and also, just wanted to let you know two important things. One, I am Hispanic. I don't know if you noticed. And I also stuttered. I stuttered all my life. Been bullied and I overcame all of that. So it's okay if you guys laugh. Trust me, I don't get offended. Your peers might frown upon it. Be careful. Um, but it, I, 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 I like to share that because at the time I get stuck in a word or I can't get the thought out completely and some people may have doubts that I know or don't know the material. Or I'm making stuff up because I'm, I'm looking to the right, which it really doesn't really work. Um, but I, 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 I always like to put that out there. So anyway, as Hispanic, I studied my market. I studied my people. And I can tell you very briefly that not everybody eats beans and rice. Some people eat beans and arepas. That's Venezuela. Some people eat beans and tortillas. That was from Mexico all the way to El Salvador. Um, Honduras is pupusas. And then in the Caribbean, people eat rice, beans and rice. But in Cuba, they have to be black beans. There can't be no red beans. And in Puerto Rico and Dominican Republic, beans and rice are red beans. So you, you cannot open a Cuban restaurant and sell red beans. It's not going to work. Don't know your market. Where am I getting to this? Because I already ate, so I'm not even hungry. Where am I getting to this? You guys may work with students every single day. Probably you work with students for 25 years. You probably were in Boston, in New York, and now you're in Florida working with students. No student is the same. He might come in the similar frame, but it's not the same picture. And that's what we're going to learn today. We cannot assume. So then we're going to hang ourselves. So you guys here have... This summer term, you have 26,670 identities. Assuming that each one of those students, and I'm being serious about this, have one identity each. Some of us have more than one. We know that, right? So you're at least going to deal with 26,670 identities. How are you going to manage that? I don't know. I don't believe you guys are possible. I do not believe anybody can cater to 26,670 identities, but today... I've learned that you guys are moving forward to do that. You guys are taking huge, huge steps to actually achieve that. So you, you guys probably can't do that this summer. So identity, again, the way you think about yourself, the way you are viewed by the world, and the characteristics that define you. Now I want to talk about, I'm going to leave that there. I'm going to talk about identity economics. There's a book titled Identity Economics written by, by two economists, Rachel Cranton and George Akerlof. Uh, identity economics captures the idea that people make economic choices on both things, mo monetary incentives and their identity. What am I going to get out of it? And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to touch on that later. 
And who am I? Am I allowed to have this? Am I allowed to buy this or not? That all comes into play. Again, what is identity? The identity is the way you think about yourself, the way you are viewed by the world, the way the characteristics that define you. Very important for the rest of the presentation. So George Akerlof said, once you know who somebody wants to be or is, you will know what their motivations are because there is an ideal of how they should behave. This is what I believe you can do with students. You know where they want to go, or you know who they think they're going to be or who they think they are. You know, I call my kids entrepreneurs in for information, and I treat them like entrepreneurs. Here, you could probably do the same thing. If you learn what motivates them, you will learn how to get them going. And every single student has a different motivation. We know that. All right. Behavioral economics, the theory about human making financial decisions. So be, behavioral economics, it's, it's a complement to traditional economic theory. Yeah, it studies the effect of psychologically, cognitive, emotional, and cultural, social as well, uh, effects on effects of factors that make uh, uh, that make you make the decision to make economic decisions individuals. Either you make a decision, you don't make a decision. If you make a decision or fail to make one, it's still a decision. And that is what this is going to help us do. Figure out why and how. Most of, most of our choices, we take our time and we analyze. But as we grow or go or get older, we look for shortcuts. And one of those shortcuts are heuristics, right? Heuristics are mental shortcuts that we use to make decisions faster, emphasizing on the faster. We now learn about the news in seconds. If there's a catastrophe in the other side of the world, it took a day or two for us to read it, and you had the shock factor. That <gasps> now, oh, 100 people die. Next tweet. It's that simple. It's so cold now. It's not like before. The same thing with decisions. Instead of the analyzing one option at a time and finding out which one is actually the best for maximization, we take a shortcut. We take heuristics that are mental rules of thumb that allow us to jump past any hard thinking, any number crunching, and you're making a decision. One of those examples in heuristics, for an example, you you want to go eat a burger like Uncle Bob's burger, but you move to a different town. Where you move around, you there like you open up Yelp, right? You open up Yelp, and you have like twenty five burger joints around you. What do we do? So you start thinking, okay, I wanna. A burger like Uncle Bob's because I'm, I'm, I'm homesick. Start looking at the ingredients. And you hone down as much as possible to the burger place that looks the most, or, or, or in paper, it seems like it's going to take the most, like Uncle Bob's. Why? Because you're not going to go, I mean, you can, or heuristics tells you that there's a shortcut. You're not going to go and try every single burger joint, 20, 25 burgers. To then decide, okay, it was number three, so I'm going to go back. I'm going to eat 26 burgers now. That's not going to happen. It's going to take you a long time. The time that it takes to make this evaluation, the heuristic saves it. Why? Because if you already know that Uncle Bob used to put, I don't know, honey mustard in your burger, and this, this restaurant over here has that option, you're most likely going to go there first. It might not be the best burger, but it's good enough. And that's what we're talking about. Heuristics can help you get to the good enough. For example, a single female or a single male, they, want, they start feeling lonely, they want a significant other. The normal thing to do, I'm single, I'm going to go check the whole entire single universe. You never know. I mean, you can, but it's going to be a little bit difficult to date every single person in the world. So you go find out which one is the one you like. 
heuristics. We tell you, okay, so you like salsa dancing. Probably gonna find somebody that knows that a salsa dance. Uh, that person, I don't know, is five six, and she likes some tall. She's gonna go look with the guys that are six one. Little by little, you start honing down to it. Instead of dating everybody that's six one around the world, and they find out which one was better. Heuristics again helps you get to the decision faster. It gets you there just for the simple point of si of making it simpler, saving time. It's a good enough option. It's not the best option. But heuristics can also hurt us. For example, there is cognitive bias, right? So I always go to my accountant. I develop a good, a good relationship with my accountant. We travel together. We hang out together. Our families spend holidays together. We even bought the same car, same color, the same day. And we took a selfie and put it on Instagram. So one, and every time I go, and I ask, the, I mean, I'm not talking about me. I'm just giving an example. <laughs> it's kind of weird. <laughs> but anyway, I go to the account, and I ask him about finances, IRAs, 401k, and I follow his advice. So one day, since we have the two cars, same car, we know each other, I go to him, and I say, hey, the car's making this sound. I had the same problem. Go change this. So without going to a mechanic, he goes and changes that. That wasn't it. It becomes a bigger problem. And then what happens? Obviously, the accountant wasn't the right guy to go talk to. But heuristics and you're trying to minimize time and just get to the good, in, the, the good enough answer made you go into cognitive bias. You think that everything that the accountant says is right, and it's not. So, heuristics, again, it's the rule of thumb. They help us distinguish better options from the worst ones. But it doesn't help you maximize your choice. It just gives you an optimization. And you see, it saves you time, the cost that it takes to search for the ideal answer versus the cost of benefiting from finding that product, service, individual that you need right away. Heuristics. Framing. Okay. Framing is the effect that, that, that changes people when the same objective information is presented in two different ways. I was talking about a picture, right? You have the picture, you can change your frame, but the picture is still the same. For example, I'm in the financial services business, I've been in this business for 21 years. I used to sit with people and tell them, okay, if you put $1,000 into the, this investment, there's a chance that you're going to lose 60%. We'll get away from that one right away. But then I used to tell them, if you could put the same $1,000, this investment is going to give you the chance of earning 40%. You're going to go with that. It was the same thing. I just turned it around. If you, you invest here, you lose 60, or you can win 40. But I'm telling you the, the negative part first. Over here, I'm telling you that you're going to make 40%, but I'm not reminding you that you are going to lose the 60. The same thing, I'm just changing the frame. That happens a lot. And the reason why we use that is because you can use that technique to communicate with some students that are not going to understand what you're talking about. For example, I, I'm from South America. I grew up in South America. So a lot of the required reading is in middle school and high school that the United States has. I didn't have it. I learned the other day, literally, at 41 years old, I learned that there's a story of the four, the four bulls and the lion. I'm sure you guys are familiar with it, that the four bulls hang out together and the lion's starting to eat them and he can't. And then when the four bulls get into a fight and they're standing on their own, the bull eats all four of them one by one. But anyway, in third grade, they're talking about it. And it's this big thing. And my wife looked at me while I was there. She was like, uh, you're supposed to read that in third grade. I'm like, uh, in New York, we didn't have that. Okay, so now we're going to talk about 
economic inequality. We are 23 minutes in. We're, we're a little behind now. Yeah. So economic inequality. Inequality and redistribution have always been a central political problem. Yep, now it's starting to feel normal. Now I'm sweating. Now I'm sweating. Now I'm sweating, and here we go. Okay, so, and we have two arguments, right? The right-wing argument or the free market position is that the market is going to settle itself down. Supply, demand, entrepreneurs, the government is going to determine the taxation levels, and everything is going to be fine. The left wing says the government must take a different approach. They have to hunt down on re redistribution, taxes. They believe in challenging the marketing forces. They want to set their own prices. And they increase taxations on profit of capitalists, not anybody else. And they balance wages with strict schedules. That's minimum wage. Minimum wage is not good for the student. And I'm going to talk to you guys about that. I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to go hound it down. So let's talk about income inequality. Just going to give you some stats, and then I'm going to get into the examples. In the United States, our taxation rules or policies do help increase the gap between the poor and the rich. Empirical evidence shows it. It's like they were designed for that. From 2008 to now, that gap has increased by 30%. We're number one in the world on income inequality, followed by England. Similar ideas. In Florida, we're, we're the 49th worst state in income inequality, only followed by New York. Florida's top 1% of the families make 40 times more than the 99% of us. I'll say that again. 1% of the families in Florida make 40 times more than what 99% of everybody else makes. That 1% in Florida makes $1.5 million a year. The average 99% makes $39,000. $94 a year. It's sick. It really is. Uh, if we compare Orlando, all the cities in the tri-county area and the counties, we're the worst in the nation. We top them. We take them over. We're number one. It's even, even worse than San Francisco. It's not even funny, right? So the Florida, the income inequality is, is so bad that in Orlando, the 1% in Orlando makes 11 times more than what the 99% make in the city of Orlando alone. Which leads to housing. So you guys know we have a huge housing issue, right? So you have the middle-income families. Excuse me. You have the middle-income families who are making a little bit more than the low-income families. However... Rents are being charged at the middle income level, which means that the low income families are being forced to spend more of their dollars to try to have a roof. Thir only 13 families can afford, and there are 13 houses available to rent out of every 100 low income families. So there are 87 families out of every 100 are homeless in Central Florida, or they're living with another family in like a four or five bedroom house and they split it. Happens right across my house, by the way. They have six cars, two families. It, it's a five, it's a two story, five bedroom home. I don't know how they do it, but they get along just fine. More power to them. Again, Orlando Metro area currently has only 13 affordable and available rental homes for every 100 low income renters. Reality. So, now we're going to talk about wages, supply and demand. I don't know if you heard, but I hear it all the time. I know some of those politicians. Everybody's talking about a $15 wage per hour. That's going to help things. But today, I'm going to show you a different perspective. You're talking to a welfare child. A kid that used to go with their parents to get the weak cheese. 
can't find the weak cheese. That's the best cheese we ever had, the weak cheese. Right? Right? The weak cheese is awesome. Big brown tube or cylinder, whatever you want. Can't find it. So we know what it is to be poor. Here in Central Florida, a family of four averages $40,000 a year income. It's not bad. $40,000 a year. The mom takes 10 bucks an hour. Father take 10 bucks an hour. They make 40 hours. If they make overtime, that's great. That's for savings, vacation, shoes, braces, etc. Health insurance is one of the main things that they need to use, right? So you have Affordable Care Act that Barack put it in place. We go out there and we apply. Family of four pays $200 a month for health insurance. Awesome. Everything is going great. You have your Section 8. You have some food stamps because, again, it's not enough. It's not enough. And we go about life. Then comes state senator bragging about 15 bucks an hour that you're getting paid too little. There's income inequality. It's right until then. Right when you change it at $15 an hour, the whole perspective just changed for that family. Because you go from making $40,000 to making $60,000. The first thing that's out is Section 8. Got to move out next month. And what you going to pay for a two-bedroom? I looked it up. 16500 So your rent just went up $1,000. Let's take a minute. So you got an increase of $20,000. Taxes on that is 10%. So you're going to take home 18000 Out of the 18000 you already got to pay 12000 into rent. The Section 8 just left. Second thing, I got to go healthcare.gov and update my application. Make more than that. All right? Mm, eh, Mr. Daddy, I'm going to take the $600 I was giving you a month to pay for health insurance. And I'm just going to give you half. All right, I'll take half. Now I'm paying $500 a month for, for health insurance, family for Still not bad. So you take the 300 you multiply it by 12, that's $3,600. You add it, no, you just subtract it from the 20000 You have 20000 minus taxes, that was eighteen minus 12000 that it was in the increased rent. You have 6000 left, keep up with me. Then we take $3,600 off that. Now you got to pay for health insurance. What happens? You have $2,400 left. $200. Hmm? Thank you. So that's $2,400. And you can say, well, I, lo I lost the food stamps, right? Okay. We'll have an extra $200 a month to pay for groceries. Right? And we can go to church on Wednesdays and get a fruit bag of food. When, when, whenever they're giving out food. We can handle it, honey. Let's move on. Some other people need to help. We were there. We were right there. But then what happens? Now you're gonna go apply for the apartment. You and your you and your wife take the day off. You go in and you sit down. You're all happy, looking good. All right. The first thing: two hundred and twenty-five dollars for administration for your application. Go and in your pocket. Second thing: forty-five dollars for each background check. That's nine. Where am I? 315 bucks. First month, last month, and somebody else's month. You got to put in $3,650 to move into a two-bedroom apartment, and you're on the waiting list. Section 8 is kicking you out. You're out, mommy. At the end of the month, you got to go. So where are you going to go? That's the $15 an hour going to do to you. That's only the one end. Let me tell you the other side. Right, so now... Because of the senator passed the bill, got approved, wages go up, great. My payroll taxes as a business owner just went up 50%. I'm not going to be able to keep everybody. So Juan or Pedro decides, one of you staying home because I can't keep up with both. All right, Pedro's going home, Juan's staying with me, great. Juan, you got to do all the work because I can't hire somebody else. I just can't. Some people believe that you could cut your profits. And that is where I have an issue with. A person can make a product, can sell it. They have a specific product. That was their idea. That was their risk. Not because you want to impose other things and you're 
in disposing of these people's issues it, because you want to pass a law, it causes a whole havoc. But not, that is just not everything. Let's just say the business owner is a nice guy and say, you know what, I'm going to make less profit so I can get Pedro and Juan here because I like them. Great. But you know what, I just got to up my prices now. Because cost of labor or cost of service is just increased by 50%. So now I'm going to charge my client more. So the $15 that you got, you're paying more for milk and hamburgers, ain't going to get you further. That's not the way. What's the way? Education. Because it worked for me and it works for many other people. So now we're going to talk about your first generation students. I'm a first generation student. 43.5% of your students are first generation. So if you have 26,679 identities in the in this summer term here, you're going to have 11,612 first generation students. And we're a whole entire different breed. A whole, we, we bring a whole bunch of issues. And the ones that finish college have one nightmare, at least once a month, that you need one credit to graduate. It's documented. Empirical evidence is behind it. That's what we suffer. Every month you have that dream, and let me tell you, you get up in sweats because you wanted it so bad and you dreamed of taking it away. Now, being a first generation student was hard. I don't like to say things that hard. I'm from the Bronx. At 11 years old, I've seen many things that adults have not seen in their 60s. It was just part of the deal, it was part of what I grew up. Dog facing people, getting loud, all of that. It was part of the deal. It was part of the survival. But being a first generation student was hard. Really hard. And I'm going to tell you why in a minute. Right? So, went to Ecuador, came back. So now I had to go, because the United States works this way, I had to take American government, PE, and American literature. I think it was American literature or English, I don't know. But anyway, I had to take three courses to graduate. So I went to Lake Brantley. So it was the closest high school at the time. I went to Lake Brantley High School, three months, graduated, got out of there. Went to Seminole Community College, studied English for two years. Then I, did, I got my AA. I did the four and a half year thing. But I didn't know what to do. I used to go there with my mom. Come on, mom, let's go. My mom didn't speak English. Well, I'm taking it, which is my mom. But and my dad was at work working two jobs. So take my mom in. My mom can't communicate. I'm translating. And she's just doing her best. I got to make the decision. At Seminole Community College, I was lucky enough, I ran into Mr. Chin. And Mr. Chin probably doesn't even know the impact he had on me. Mr. Chin was a counselor from the Bronx, Asian. He, he knew how to talk. He understood. He got me through college, at least for my associates. The other person that got me through my associates was my speech one-on-one -on -one teacher. Professor, I'm sorry. Professor, I can't say teacher. I was correct earlier. She got me through my AA because, I don't know if I told you. I, I think I told you a story, right? Anybody said that? Yeah, okay. Here goes this kid, skinny twig, walking into speech one-on-one, -on -one, can barely speak English, can definitely read it. Didn't speak it much at the time. And I tell her that I want to give speeches for a living. And she says, and what's the problem with that? And that's when I start stuttering. And she says, that's not a problem. You could be a speaker that stutters. <laughs> You'll be totally different. Eventually, as, as, as you can see, I don't stutter as much. I was successful at work. I hired my own therapist. I overcame my issue. Or at least mentally I did. So she got me through there. It was tough. It was really tough. Later, I'm going to tell you the other story about finishing up at UCF. But this is key. All right. So the state of Florida states that a person with a high school degree and no secondary, post-secondary education makes $27,356 a year. It divided by 52 weeks period, 526, 40 hours a week. 
13, 15. You know they're not making 13, 15. Nobody's getting paid no 13, 15 in Central Florida. Everybody's getting 9, 50, 11, 50. If you're lucky, you're getting 12, 50. So we take the 13, 50 and we pay the student. Let's just say the majority of your students are coming to school full time and they can work 25 hours part time. And why do they need to work? Because they got to help at home. I just told you all they make is $40,000. Do you know that if you make under $40,000, there's only a 10% chance of your kid getting a bachelor's degree by the age of 24? 10%. Money's going to get in the way. If your household makes more than $75,000, there's an 80% chance that your kid will get a bachelor's degree by the age of 24. Huge. It's huge. So, they're, they're already struggling, but I'm Hispanic. They went ahead and, let me see, phone's ringing. Some, something's vibrating around here. But anyway, we, we my, my son graduates high school. We're going to take him to, to college. Great. Wonderful. He doesn't know what to do. He signs up. He got himself into a student loan that he has no clue he did, nor do we, because I, I, my dad was at work. My mom couldn't read the papers. It was a mess. But you get him a car, right? Graduate. Right? You get him a new car, and you tell him, okay, puppy, I got you the car so you can go to school because public transportation is going to take you a week to get from campus to campus. I mean, geez, a week, literally. And I know Ben Johnson, the former CEO of Lynx, Great guy. He did a phenomenal job. Just ran out of time. He just ran out of time. Because I knew what he was trying to do. He, he came from Atlanta. He wanted to change this thing. Didn't, didn't have the money. Didn't have the time. So he gets a job. Let's say that the kid's making thirteen fifty. He's not. So that's two sixty three a week for 25 hours. Or 20 hours in time. You pay taxes, you pay Social Security, 1630, Medicare, 381, Federal, 35, your net pay is 207, 92. That's what you take home that week. All right, annual net, 10,810 with 28 cents. But now let's bring it real. Daddy said that he'll give me the nice tercel used and I'm thankful. But I got to pay the insurance. You know, 18 years old paying no $2,100 a year. You know that. But let's just play along. Just because if I accept the $1,350, you are going to accept my $2,100 in insurance a year. Then you put $50 a month servicing the car. Tires, belts, oils, whatever. And let's hope that our college student eats a $5 meal three times a week. 52 weeks a year. I mean, a young man that just finished high school should be allowed to eat a $5 meal at least three times a week, right? There's no money for dating, by the way. So that's 780 Let's just say that you put $20 of gas per week, which you know at 284 a gallon, it's not going to work. But let's just go with it. Total net, you end up with $6,290.28. cents. 52 weeks, that's $120 in your pocket. It's not enough. And then I'm going to tell you my story, then most likely the story of your student. It's okay, I signed up to school. I already know that the first week I can withdraw. Great, I go to the bookstore. I got my, I got my list. I took my syllabus. I'm going to go get the books. The first book I'm going to look at, $227. That's it, it's over. You can't afford the book. But why is the book 227? Why can I get the used book? Because as I was standing there, I heard somebody talking about used books. I'm like, ah, I'm going to get a used book. No, 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 no. You can't use a used book. Why? Because they changed the font. And the professor wants a new font. All right, well, I get the new book. So you get the book, and then you go home and look at the syllabus because it comes wrapped in plastic, right? So you, you open the plastic, you can't turn. So you start looking at the syllabus. There's only four chapters you're going to cover out of that book. Fine. Bought the book, put it in a credit card, 
bought the book, put it on the credit card. I'll sell it back at the end of the, the year. I'll get money back. Take the book back, $20.43 for the $200 book. Now, I'm not disputing the business model of the bookstore, please. That's not my intent. My intent is to show you the reality. So now you're sore because it was $180 that you read four chapters. And you got to be in the class. You didn't even get an A. So next semester comes the same ordeal. But, you know, you're still hurting from that book. So you go check out how much of the same used book with a new font. They're going for $120. they are making $100 on your book. Now you're upset. Then you tally up all the other books that you got to get for all the other old courses. And you can't afford it. So since you have seven days to withdraw, you withdraw. Right here, twice. Two semesters. Two semesters. But then life gets in the way. All right? To me, to me, 18 years old, was having a car, da, 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 da. my dad got cancer. Thought of the worst. I went ahead and, you know, my dad got a third job. He just wanted to get a third job. He had the dishwashing job at the, at the night. And he still does it because he loves it. He had the factory job in the morning. And then he had pizza delivery. So you know what? I don't know what's going to happen. I got to get myself ready because the dad goes, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm the other guy, right? I'm, I'm 20 years old, 19 years old, so I got to help out. I go get a job. I was getting paid 610 at Disney. I was a character. I loved it. But it wasn't bad because gas was 89 cents. I don't know if you guys remember 89 cents, right? That was fun. 1996, 1997. Ooh, you, and I had a four-cylinder, so you could drive like a bus. I four had no traffic. There was never traffic on I-4. It was awesome. Life was beautiful in Florida. I'd go about it. But, so I got to do more hours. I got to do 40 hours of this. You now take a full-time job. I audition. I knew how to dance. I knew how to perform. I was fit. I got the Hercules Parade gig. Got hired for two years full-time to do a parade. It was fun. I had sent the HBO commercials. It was beautiful. A 20 years old, that's life, right? But then Costco came to town. Costco showed up. I don't know if you guys remember when Costco showed up. And I'm walking by, you know, whatever. I'm check out Costco. They're hiring. They're paying twelve fifty because they have a union, right? So they set the price. They're paying twelve fifty an hour to push carts, right there. The line was around the corner. What happens when you set the wages above market? You have an overflow of applicants. Not everybody's going to get hired. We know that. So I was lucky enough to get hired. I quit Disney because I'm getting paid double over here. And I'm working only 25 hours. Life is beautiful. But I'm not going to go back to school. Why am I going to go back to school? I'm making 250. Everybody else is making, I think it was 575. Because I was a character performer. I was making 610 at Disney. But now I'm getting cost of 1250. I'm happy. I'm going to try to get full time. Make more money. I'm going to go back to school. What for? There's no point. Time goes by. Two years go by. Your mom, go to school, 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 school. Fine. I'll go back to school. I got my associate, so I decided to go to UCF now. I'm going to go to UCF. We're going to take these classes, all of that. First semester, bad, bad. Probation and whatever else. Second semester, got kicked out. Literally, got kicked out. Couldn't go back. Went by, applied. All right, they took you back in. Kicked out again. All right, I'm going to go to work. I'm going to go to work and take some time off. Had a lot of things on my mind. They were more expensive driving to Ottoman to UCF. The books were more expensive. I was keeping myself in debt. Getting more student loans, try to make things happen. Eventually, I decided to go back to school. I'm thinking about life. I'm probably going to meet somebody that's pretty. Probably going to want to marry her. I have a couple of kids. I should go back to school. Stop selling. I was good in sales. But, you know, that time came when they wanted to promote you to manager. And the facts, remember faxes? 
you fax your resume and the A looks like a B, but then they ask you for the transcript and you show up with your AA degree and they won't give you the job because you have an AA. The, at the time, it was the New York life. No, no, you got to have a bachelor's, bro. Got upset, quit the company. I left the company. I went to work at State Farm. We won agreement. The guy hired me and I said, I need to finish school. He says, I'll give you whatever time you need, but you got to make up the hours on Saturday. Awesome. Count on it. So I was driving from Apopka to UCF. Every Tuesday and Thursday mornings and every Tuesday and Thursday nights to finish it out. But that's not the story. Remember, I got kicked out of school twice, right? For grades. They weren't going to let me back in. Appeal denied. Appeal denied. The, the third appeal, I got to speak in front of the board of trustees. Went ahead and do my thing and blah, blah, blah. There was this gentleman in an electric chair, a veteran, the hair, the glasses, everything. And asked me, what is it going to be different? I have a full-time job now. And the guy says that I can go to school. All right, with one condition, we'll let you in. You got to get straight A's. I didn't have a choice. Because if I didn't get straight A's, I wasn't going to get the 2.0 to graduate. I had like a 2.9, no, 2.79 or something. It was horrible. Horrible. I, was, I, I wouldn't even let myself in, but I worked myself back in. Straight A's, graduated. Everybody was happy. My grandmother, my grandfather, everybody went to the graduation. It was great. Kept on working, blah, blah, blah. Along the way, I met the National Society of Hispanic MBAs. I thought I had topped my limit. They said, nah, man, what's the matter with you? You're young, you're smart. You can do more. Go get a master's degree. I can't do that. Yeah. Eventually, enough japping. I'm going to go get a master's degree. But I already had a daughter. So I couldn't really go anywhere else. I had to figure out a way here. And it was right in the middle of the Great Recession. Here I go. I'm going to go to school. So I, I first talk it over at the house. He didn't go well. My father-in-law. You don't even have a job. You work on commissions. He worked for Delta for 32 years. Different story, right? And I married the only daughter of four kids. Blonde, green eyes, beautiful woman. Walk into I'm very nice. I'm, she is very nice. A very nice lady. Yeah, I'm going to go to school. Are you crazy? Blah, blah, blah. I lost my house. Yeah, I forgot, I forgot to tell that to the other people. We lost the house of foreclosure. My father-in-law bought a house, and he allowed me to stay there with my wife and kids. He bought a house for the daughter. I'm going back to school. After the whatever at the house, now I got to get accepted. <laughs> I already know, because, you know, I already knew what was going on, that I had a 2.0. And homeboy over here wants to go to Rollins. You see everyone saying you think Rollins is going to take me. Well, you know what? I started doing research, right? What was the average GPA? <laughs> Double mine. What was the average age? Five years less than mine, so forth and so on. I mean, I was not going to fit in. But you know what? I had a story. I had a story and I had a transcript to prove it. Packed my stuff, went, went online to apply. I wasn't going to apply online. I figured it out real quick. I already know the parameters. I can't do that. I got to go do it in person. So I worked myself to a missions office. Alice Argeros was the lady that I got to see that day. And I told her my story. <laughs> she was like, well... You know, it's going to be hard, but now it's the two of us, because I bought your story. I graduated from Cromer with an MBA. They waived my GMAT, and they took me in with no restrictions on academics, because I told my story. And I can tell you the story about what happened in Cromer. It's a whole different first generation, 30 years old, with one daughter, a son on the way, and driving a hoopty where the average student drives a seven series BMW. <laughs> Talk about feeling out of place and your identity messes with you because you're still that dude from the Bronx. That's who you still are. And that's who I'd always be. I just got educated. Don't get it twisted. <laughs> so, we went through that. That's Mr. Chen. 
went to school, age 24, Costco story, gave you that story, the books, oh man, you guys are going to like this. So we have the first generation, right? And the kids are making one twenty ninety six a week after all the expenses. But that's a boy. Girls make 80 cents on every dollar. The girls take $96 home at 120 And my daughter's a girl. And I do things like a girl. Because she's not going to suffer what I suffer. That's for sure. So girls are even worse. And you guys have a lot of girls that are first generation in this school. Because I saw your data. If your data is accurate, we, we got to change that. Now, move forward again. Nope, go back. That's not it. So, another thing to tell you. In 2025, 60% of the jobs are going to require post-secondary education certification. 60% on every job in six years is going to require post-secondary education. Your bulk of students, 61% of your students, 16,410 to be exact, adding the age group of 18 to 24. You cannot allow yourself for them to quit. They cannot quit. It's impossible. How are they going to survive? They can't. They won't. It's tough. If 60% of the jobs are going to require a bachelor's degree. Because an AA is going to be too short, unless you're, you know, computer science. That's a whole different ballpark. But you guys have a big task to do, man. A big, huge task. Okay, so now, now I'm going to talk to you about emotional intelligence, awareness, and control. I'm going to teach, I'm going to talk to you how this five pillars, and remember that's me, so it's almost over. It's almost over. These five pillars are going to help you cope, understand, Put themselves in their shoes and what your students are going through. Because that's key. Remember, identity. I know who I am. I know who I want to be. I wanted to be the stuttering guy that gave speeches. I got here. I just had some issues along the way. But I overcame them because of Mr. Chin, speech teacher, professor, Alex Argeros. There's always that person. you got to be that person. You got to be that superhero without a cape. If not, I wouldn't be here. They don't believe in you. You don't believe in yourself. Self-awareness. You need to know what you are or who you are. When I was going to Cromer, I already knew I wasn't what they wanted. I didn't have the GPA. I didn't have the background. I didn't have any. I didn't even have the money to take the GMAT. But I was aware. So I gave them my story. Same thing with you guys. You have information about your students. Research it. And you know, heuristics, remember that we spoke about heuristics? And I'm going to be frank with you because it happened to me. English teacher. He said it to me, I remember. And I still remember when he said it to me because he was biting on his glasses and his nose started bleeding. I don't know why he got a nose bleed, but he had a nose bleed. Because remember, if you put an event with emotions, you don't forget it. Event and emotions, you will never forget that day. And he told me I was just like the other kids that come from South America. Don't make that mistake. Don't see the Spanish kid that gets there right on time or late to class. And he has to leave early. You know why he's doing that? Because he probably lives in Altamont and drives all the way to La Fea, and then he has to leave because he has to be at work at 10 o'clock in a pop car, and there's more traffic. Don't get it wrong. There's always a story behind it. So you got to be self-aware. Right? You have to know what you know about your students and what you know about yourself and what you're going to go through and what is going to happen. Then you got to self-regulate. You know, I, I, uh, I, uh, I know, I know individuals that know what sets them off. Get there late, they have an issue. You leave early, they have an issue. 
You wear jeans, they have an issue. Self-regulate. Know what bothers you. For example, with me. You, you know, in Rawlings, I learned where I was good at, and that was working alone. So I was, like I said, I was Hispanic. I don't know if you noticed. Hispanic, and I was the only one in the 31 people cohort, the only minority there. They break you all into groups because they have this new way of making people work in groups, right? I got kicked out of both groups. They said I was dumb. They said I was dumb, that I couldn't hack it. But what they didn't know is that this guy right here won the mathematics medal of the city of New York in fifth grade. And then they moved them to seventh grade. And because I was little and I was a nerd and I didn't want to make other people's homework, I got jumped on my way home. And my mother sent me to Ecuador because of that. It's probably the story would have been different. So I had to tell the lady, let me be alone. You won't hack it. Groups, the entire groups have failed to graduate. I got this. This is easy. I got it. After I became a group of one, it will never be known, but that group of one got the highest grades in every single class after that. They had the Toyota case. I got a 99 out of 100. There was a finance course. I got a 98 because the professor said I had a typo. And I said, that's my writing style. He said, you take an 88 or you take the 98? I said, I'll take the 98. Walk away. I got you, puppy. He's the boss. But I had to self-regulate. And you got to self-regulate, too. You got to make sure you know what triggers either your happy emotions, because you can't be too happy, or your upset emotions. Because there's always a reason. At my breakout session, if you guys come to a breakout session, I'm going to go deep on this one. I got them mixed up earlier, but not this time. And then you have the motivation, right? Gets you going. I wanted to speak since I was little, since I was young. I saw myself in front of stages, talking to people. I know what I needed to do, dress well, wear a tie. I only own, own one pair of jeans. Kid you not, they're old, but now it's in, in to look all raggedy. So the jeans are fine. I'm not buying another pair. But you got to find what motivates the student, right? You, you got to find what motivates you to motivate the student. Every story is different. Then we're going to talk about empathy. Empathy is key. All right, empathy is I feel what you feel. I cry when you cry. Um, ability to understand and share the feelings of others. In order to, if you were to learn, nurture empathy, you develop your leadership skills, you boost your teamwork. When you say you boost your teamwork, obviously you're leading students. You get them excited. You get them involved. They want to do more for you. And that's what you need. Show them empathy. Ask them about their day. But be intentional about it. You, you know, it, it's funny. Um, I have two kids, right? So somebody asks now. Not much now because now you have Facebook. And people go and creep up in your pictures. But in the past, you know, you used to be like, hey, how are you kids? You ask me about your kids, it's over. But here comes the pictures and here we go. And if you're not looking at the pictures, so I'm going to ask you, so why did you ask me if you didn't want to look at them? Right? You have to be empathetic. So if you're going to ask me about the pictures, you got to look at the picture. You cannot not look at the picture. I'm showing you my kids, my pride and joy. In motivation, Mark Twain said it best. The most important days in your life is the day you are born and the day you find out why. I found out that I was born to speak to people and tell them stories. Because the only way to be able to be empathetic is through stories. And then your social skills. Don't be the professor that is always, you know, upset or running around or preoccupied in your previous class and the class that's coming. Develop an, a, a relationship with the student. You never know if the student is going to be talking and they're going to record them talking about Mr. Chief in Seminole Community College 
or the speech 101 professor that he had, or Alex and Gerald's the ones, the one that helped me get through my MBA. You never know what the student is going to become. But if he remembers that you were nice, he's probably going to be nice back if you ever need anything. So this platform here, self-awareness, self-regulation, motivation, empathy, and social skills are the five pillars that I believe are going to help you have a breakthrough to be able to engage with your students and that age group from 18 to 24, that in the next six, in the next six years, are going to, 60% of them are going to need to have a degree in order to get a job, is going to finish school. And the goal here is for the kids to finish school, I think, right? And for everybody to make more money, because if everybody is educated and they can get better jobs, what's going to happen? The whole entire community is going to rise up together and not separate. Ladies and gentlemen, that is my presentation for tonight. Muchas gracias. That's my phone number, my Twitter handle, my LinkedIn profile, and my email. Thank you.